So, uh, yeah, I, I, after seeing the other keynotes that were scheduled for this event, I thought that you had really great representation in mobile location-based stuff. So I decided that I would take the leap to developing a new talk, uh, which is reporting on research that I've just recently completed on how U.S. teens are engaging with new media, specifically gaming, internet, digital media production. So I'll start with an overview of the study, the methods, our frameworks, and then present some of the details of the ethnographic work. So the Digital Youth Study was a large collaborative research project that was supported by the MacArthur Foundation. It was conducted by a large team of 29 researchers and research collaborators. So here are some of the core members of the research team. Is this sounding okay for some reason? Okay. Getting an echo. Okay, so the project spanned a three-year period where we developed 22 different case studies of youth new media practice. We dipped into a wide range of different online groups and youth populations. Some of the case studies were particular online sites like YouTube, MySpace, Facebook. Some were particular interest groups like gaming groups, fandoms, video, uh, hip-hop music production. And in some of the case studies, we found youth through local uh, institutions uh, like uh, parent networks, schools, and after-school programs. So in all of these cases, our approach was ethnographic. We relied on a mixture of interviews, questionnaires, online observations, and hanging out in both online points of view, uh, really capture their voices. Our premise was that we really needed to get involved in looking at the online universe from a youth point of view, and by doing that, we were hoping to understand the key social and cultural drivers of innovation and cultural change in the internet space. Our perspective was in many ways a classic ethnographic one where we relied on observation and deep hanging out and we were positioning ourselves as translators of sometimes exotic and unfamiliar kinds of social practices by marginalized social groups. But in other ways our work was quite unconventional by classic ethnographic standards. As you probably know, it's relatively rare to have ethnographic study that's this broad in scope and collaborative at this scale. Unlike quantitative surveys, we weren't really out to get a representative sample of youth, but we were interested in expanding beyond an approach which is typical in ethnography, which is looking at spotlights of different case studies. And what we wanted to do was to combine that kind of deep ethnographic looking uh, in a way that combined uh, those cases with analysis of cross cases in a way that got at how different subcultures and youth groups were defined in relation and in opposition to one another. So my argument in this work, as well as other studies of network practices that I've looked at, is that we really need to develop new kinds of methods and modes of analysis where we are looking deeply at the texture of culture and experience, while also being able to trace how these experiences are embedded and part of a broader network ecology. So this project is one effort at developing these kinds of methods. <coughs> So that's a little bit of background on our research. What I want to do now is outline some of the broad socio-technical shifts that our work is responding to before turning to some of the description. So there's two big changes that we've been looking at in the media environments of youth in the US. One is the growing availability of tools for creating and modifying digital images, videos, and music. The second big factor is that kids are creating and sharing these digital works in a context of public visibility. Not only do they have the ability to create new media, but they're able to publish, share, and distribute them on the internet. What we're seeing now, which is extremely interesting, is the ways in which the context between commercial media, amateur media, and personal media are being uh, munged together, to use a technical term. It's really, to, they're playing in the same space in the internet in ways that are quite different from how media used to be distributed. And new kinds of social and expressive forms are emerging as a result. So if you put these things on a scale where there's large-scale cultural, professional media production on one end, and personal communication like IM, email, everyday conversation on one end, there's a lot of interesting things happening these days in the middle. And this middle is what we've been focusing on in our work. Uh, this is the ways in which new network technologies are opening up a space of communication that's larger than purely personal and private communication, but it's not at the scale of mass or commercial media production. This is the scale of small niche and local publics. <clears throat> 
This social and technical ecology is what we call networked publics. Network publics is a term that we use to reference the peer-to-peer -peer and many-to-many -many ecologies of people, media, and communication that are, we're seeing proliferating on the internet today. <coughs> The growing pervasiveness of digital tools and networks, peer-to-peer -peer distribution and communication, the activation of niche and edge players, the aggregation of culture at a massive scale through digital networks. Now, I know all of this is not exactly news to any of you here in this room, and these are all trends that we can understand pretty well at a high level of abstraction. But our goal for this project was really to look carefully at the ways in which these broad changes were playing out in the everyday lives of youth in the U.S. And in many ways, the accessibility to network publics have a more profound effect on youth than on most adult populations because their access to public life is more limited. At the same time, youth are in a life stage where they're struggling for autonomy from their parents and working on crafting identities within the context of peer cultures. <clears throat> What we were interested in documenting was this unique alchemy between the energy that young people bring to engaging with their peers and this newfound access to broader publics through the internet. So until fairly recently, the online world was dominated by geeks. Marginal youth who were early adopters used the net as a space to escape from their age-segregated pressure cookers of middle school and high school. Today, these subcultural online communities still exist, but in the past decade, they've really been overshadowed by more mainstream kinds of social practices represented, at least in the U.S., by sites like MySpace and Facebook. This is a familiar story of the domestication and mainstreaming of new media forms. As a set of technologies get taken up and embedded into everyday practice, they take on the shape of existing and dominant social and cultural categories and structures. This means that online life increasingly reflects the familiar cultural categories and social groupings that kids participate in as part of their everyday uh, lives. Kids are hanging out, they're socializing, they're flirting, they're engaging in negotiations over popularity and status, just like they do in the hallways, lunchrooms, locker rooms of school. At the same time, the properties of network publics amplifies these existing practices in new ways. Network, pub network publics are different from prior forms of youth publics in that they're readily accessible 24-7. They provide a persistent network peer space and that there's the potential, uh, the ability to access much broader publics and more specialized kinds of knowledge communities and networks for publicity. These affordances of network publics play out differently among, uh, depending on the specifics of the youth practices and identity. So we use the framework of genres of participation to describe how kids engage differently in different forms of network publics. Genres are patterns that emerge from our ethnographic material. They're based on categories in youth culture, like what defines <laughs> who is cool, who's popular, who's geeky, who's brainy. We don't start with predefined demographic variables like gender, race, socioeconomic status, though these were definitely at play in some, to some extent in the cases that we observed. We also don't take a technology-centric approach of categorizing kids and practices based on the specific technologies or online sites that they engage in. Instead, in a genre-based approach, we tie together the structure and content of media and the structures of participation with media in an interpretive cultural frame. So by describing these forms of participation as genres, we are hoping to avoid also the assumption that they attach categorically to individuals. So just like an individual can engage in multiple media genres, you might like action in some contexts, you might like romance at other times, youth will often engage in multiple genres of online participation in ways that are specific to the situation or the social group they're engaged in. Genres of participation allow us to identify the sources of diversity in how youth engage with new media in a way that doesn't rely on a simple notion of divides or ranking of more or less sophisticated forms of media expertise. This is about identity, culture, practice. It's not a ranking of skills and access. <clears throat> so in our work, we identified a range of different genres of participation, and that varied on the specific domain that we were looking at. But here I want to outline the main fault line between what we identified as friendship-driven and interest-driven genres of participation. So I want to start with the friendship-driven side. 
So friendship-driven participation, it leads to the most common kinds of practices that we see in young people's <coughs> online behaviors today. So for most kids, network publics and peer-to-peer -peer learning is about sites like MySpace and Facebook. It's about going online primarily to see friends and making digital media is part of this hanging out online. These practices of status display, flirting, gossiping, these are the kinds of peer-to-peer -peer sharing and reputation building that's been ubiquitous among kids ever since we put them in age-segregated context of institutionalized schooling. And all of this is being reproduced online today. Despite the perception that online media are enabling teens to reach out to new kinds of social networks online, what we found is that for the vast majority of teens, the relations fostered in school are by far the most dominant in how they define their peers and friendships, both online and offline. The dominant mode of friendship-driven participation is what kids call hanging out. So this is the relatively structured, often impromptu, ambient kind of social activity where so much of youth socializing happens. Though young people will almost always say that they prefer to hang out with their friends in real life, oftentimes the online space is the only viable way for them to really keep in touch informally with their peers. In school, young people are subject to restrictions to the kinds of socializing they can do. And out of school, there's more and more restrictions on their mobility and ability to congregate in public spaces like the mall or the street. Online sites like MySpace and Facebook, tools such as IM and text messaging, they provide opportunities for youth to hang out in these more unstructured ways and out of earshot of adults who have authority over them. So teens will usually have a small circle of intimate friends with whom they're communicating this always on mode through mobile phones and IM, and then they'll have a larger peer group that they're connected to via social network sites. In CJ Pasco's work, uh, she's one of the postdocs that was part of our study, uh, she did work on teens and intimacy, and she described how kids find friends and romantic partners and display those relationships online. So contrary to common fears, uh, flirting and dating are almost always initiated offline first in the predictable settings where you get together. The online space becomes a place to extend those relationships, to have private communication that's not under the surveillance of families and peers, and then kids also display those relations relations online in highly selective ways. So here John is describing how the key to meet them is to meet them in person first, then Facebook, and you shouldn't do it the other way around. Uh, you, you shouldn't start a relationship online. Now when teens do find romantic partners and friends through online channels, they are generally stigmatized. One participant in Megan Finn's study of Berkeley freshmen she said that she had been very shy in middle school, so she started meeting people through IN. But she says her classmates think she's weird and label her a freak so because she's meeting people online. So this perception that it's creepy to meet people online first is reinforced by public discourse and moral panics over internet safety. CJ's work clearly shows that there's a strong social norm among teens that the online space isn't a space to find new partners but there's still some important exceptions. One is the case of marginalized teens, like teens whose romantic partners are restricted for religious or cultural reasons, or for gay, lesbian, and bisexual teens. This is an excerpt from a Facebook posting by one gay teen. So he says, every time I have a crush or something, it doesn't work out. He's not gay, not enough time, etc. I am not a downer, but I'm just realizing that if a straight person's chance of compatibility is one in a hundred and, only about three in a hundred are gay, and the, and the compatibility is still 2%, then my prospect is 0.03 in a hundred, or three in 10,000. <laughs> That's not very encouraging. So as a result of this posting, one of his friends set him up on a date with another gay teen. This is not about teens reaching out to online networks and publics for random social encounters. They're using the expanded possibility of online communication selectively to overcome limitations they may have in their given local social network. For the most part, friendship-driven network publics like MySpace and Facebook are tightly intertwined with the local given context of school, that kind of intense give and take among peers that most of us probably remember from <coughs> high school. When somebody comments on your MySpace profile, you're expected to comment back. When somebody puts you on their top eight list, it's awkward if you don't do the same. 
Teens scour their peers' MySpace profiles for clues to what's cool and uncool and how to position themselves as unique individuals while also mobilizing shared markers of status. Now, we tend to think of this kind of peer culture in negative terms as peer pressure. But this kind of peer review or reciprocity is also a context of learning and engagement, where kids are evaluating and negotiating status with one another as peers and co-participants in a networked public. And this is highly motivating. Unlike their relationship to mainstream media, unlike their relationship to content activities that adults provision for them, these smaller scale local peer publics are the ones that they participate in, not just as consumers of knowledge and culture, but as producers and distributors of content, knowledge, taste, and culture. They make decisions about how to craft their profiles, what messages to write, what kinds of music, video, and artwork they want to post, link to, and forward. And these choices about what media to display and circulate are conducted in public spaces visible to their peers that have direct consequences to their reputation in the social circles that matter to them the most. The process of creating an online profile, articulating and ranking friends is one of the ways in which social media take what's normally implicit and make it explicit. And this is where network publics really do change some of the dynamics of how teen peer cultures operate. This has been the focus of Dana Boy's work on MySpace and Facebook. Deciding how to craft an online self-representation that includes how your network of friends are also represented. These are new kinds of social and expressive practices and literacies that youth are developing in tandem with a changing media landscape. How they manage these online representations can make hierarchies and social distinctions more visible and more public. They become new kinds of social resources that have both positive and negative dimensions. So kids will often talk about how they like to have the opportunity to think and reflect on the messages they put out online, how they craft their self-representation, and sometimes this is difficult to do in the moment-to-moment -moment of face-to-face -face interaction. At the same time, they also talk about how MySpace amplifies drama and tension by forcing them to make choices about how to rank friends on their profiles. The other touchy area is how social networks make romantic relationships more public and explicit. For example, couples need to decide when they are going to go Facebook official or MySpace official. <laughs> Tough decisions. This change in status from single to in a relationship can be viewed immediately by everyone in the peer network, including ex-boyfriends and girlfriends who still have a lingering interest. The public nature of social network sites makes it much easier for teens to overhear what is being said. Because teens' presence as observers to profiles and online chatter, it might be invisible. It's much easier to allow them to, as Bob says, stalk each other, keeping up with the gossip and lies of people that they don't know well, but whom they might be familiar with, and keeping up with gossip about people who they may have had a relationship with in the past but don't now. Now this is something that's familiar to anyone who's a public figure, but now we're seeing these dynamics playing out in the everyday suit, in everyday youth social worlds. This makes lessons about social life, both the failures and successes, more visible and persistent than what youth experience in the lunchroom or hallway at school. Now it's tempting to see all of this as excessive peer pressure. I also think, though, it's important to keep in perspective how these negotiations are a key part of really what it means to grow up in a digital age. These are contexts where kids are learning lessons about how to deal with peers, uh, their social identities, where they're highly motivated and engaged and feel a sense of ownership and efficacy. <coughs> One side effect, too, of the mainstreaming of this kind of online participation is that kids are picking up certain baseline forms of technical and media literacy as part of this taken for granted everyday kind of social activity. Youth help each other learn how to make MySpace profiles, they create and modify photos and videos together. Uh, they share all kinds of media online as a totally unremarkable set of social practices. Sometimes it's easy to lose sight of how new and different some of these literacies are. Participation in social network sites may seem trivial to a lot of adults, but they are part of actually a tremendous capacity building in everyday technical and media literacy. Now, most kids don't go much farther than a kind of casual and everyday messing around with technology and media in these friendship-driven genres of participation. 
But we're seeing some youth taking these capacities as a jumping off point to engage with, with, with what we've been calling more geeked out or interest driven genres of participation. So interest driven participation is not about popularity and mainstream status. It's more about the lives of the geeks, freaks, musicians, and dorks. It's the kids who are identified as smart or creative, the kids that we see at the margins of teen social worlds. This is about kids with passionate interests and serious hobbies finding peers online. It's not about the given social relations that structure kids' uh, school lives, but it's about expanding an individual social circle based on interests. Kids have, who have strong interest-based orientations will often talk about how they don't like to participate in sites like MySpace, and they prefer online forums that are focused on their interests. So many of the case studies in our project looked at these interest-driven groups. For example, we had case studies of Harry Potter fans, video blogging, Xbox Live players, MMORPG players. Although it's only a minority of youth who engaged in these really geeked out communities, a good portion of research focused on these interest-driven groups because they seem to us to exemplify some of the potential of network publics to really change the kinds of social worlds that kids have access to. So the particular domains we looked at were quite diverse, but all interest-driven groups had certain similarities in practice that distinguished them from friendship-driven genres of participation. Unlike the friendship-driven side, interest-driven participation involved expanding social networks beyond local given social groups. It also involved specializing and geeking out on niche knowledge domains. And finally, it involves a potentially bro much broader context of publicity for disseminating media that you create. So in the time I have remaining, I'm going to deep dive into one particular interest-driven case study, which was the focus of my own fieldwork. So my focus has been on amateur cultural production within the English language fandom of Japanese animation, or anime. The anime fandom is one of the most active and wider youth subcultures on the internet today. They engage in a wide range of online practices, including fan fiction, fan art, online gaming. My works focus specifically on two kinds of fan practices. One is video remixes, known as anime music videos, or AMVs. And the other is amateur subtitling, known as fan subbing. So, fan subbing is in many ways the backbone of the online anime fandom. Though English language fans, they do consume a great deal of media that is legally and commercially translated and subtitled. But, a large proportion of anime distribution happens through amateur fan networks, where fans will do the translating and subtitling of work before it's commercially released. In many cases, fan subs are the only foreign language source of anime that fans have access to for particular series. And many anime series aren't uh, released outside of Japan or only in large markets like the English language market. So in the early years of the anime fandom, fan subbers usually worked in local anime clubs. They distributed videotapes to other clubs around the country. After the advent of digital distribution, the digisubbing scene exploded and fan subtitled works reach millions of fans around the world in multiple languages. So there's dozens of different groups in the scene with different reputations. <coughs> some are known for quality, some are known for speed, some are known for different genres of anime. So the speed subgroups that translate the most popular anime series will generally try to turn around episodes within 24 hours of broadcast in Japan. They'll sometimes have people working in assembly line fashion in different time zones around the world so they can expedite workflow for faster release. Combined with sophisticated peer-to-peer -peer distribution networks that give fans instant access to these episodes, these groups reach hundreds of thousands of fans within hours of online release. In fan subgroups, there's a high degree of specialization and collaboration within each production team as well as in the community overall. Each fan subgroup will have a raw provider who collects the original episode in Japanese. They'll have a translator, an editor, a timer who times the length of time the subtitles are on screen. They have a typesetter, an encoder, and they usually have several quality checkers who review the final episodes. Although many fan subbers will experiment with different jobs and roles within a particular group, they usually have a specialty that they're attracted to. Uh, so, 
Here's an example of an interview from, uh, with an encoder in one group. And he describes how he initially became attracted to the specialty because of the depth of knowledge that he could pursue within an expert community. It just got interesting because other encoders were like, here are some tips and tricks. And there were so many tricks in how to handle the stuff that it got pretty interesting. Mastering esoteric knowledge becomes a source of status and reputation. And after gaining the status as an expert, a suburb will find that their services are in great demand within the tight-knit community. This kind of specialization, this geeking out, this delving into esoteric knowledge domains is what makes interest-driven participation so different from friendship-driven genres of network participation. <clears throat> Another suburb described for me how he got involved in fan subbing as a teenager. As early as middle school, he had discovered fan sub episodes of anime that weren't available commercially in the U.S. By high school, he was actively tracking different fan sub groups online and taking a particular liking to one group known for the high quality of their translations. When they advertised for a position as quality checker for their group, he jumped at the opportunity. I thought it was a dream come true to work for them. I QC everything as soon as they came in. I made lots and lots of suggestions. I wanted to let the team know they did the right thing by picking me. Lantis is a connoisseur of anime and fan subs. He appreciates the minute differences in quality that distinguish a carefully crafted work. Nobody in the fan sub world gets paid. But like other subbers, Lantis takes his own work very seriously. He knows that thousands of people will be viewing the episodes he's worked on. He says, I just feel so good when I can release something that conforms to my standards and make it available to the world, world of anime. And what's important is that he feels that these are my standards. They're not externally exposed. They're created and generated internally by the community in a participatory way. <laughs> and Lantis isn't the only one who cares about quality and fan subs. Although the industry might dispute this, most fans believe that good quality fan subs far exceed the quality of professionally produced subtitles. The kind of craft, the kind of care, the kind of love they put into these works are really quite different from the professional styles. Sites like this fan sub comparison site will pick apart and critique the details of different fan subs, looking at the quality of the typesetting, the translation, the fonts that were chosen, the way the episodes were encoded, and they compare different fan sub groups along these sort of detailed vectors. This peer-based ecology of review and critique is how the community develops and maintains standards. Just as with friendship-driven practices, this is a form of peer pressure and reciprocity, but it's one that's oriented to improving craft and media production. Just like you see with social network sites, participants in these groups feel that they have a stake and a voice in how standards are developed. Now, I want to highlight another unique aspect of interest-driven genres of participation. Many of them are directed outwards to broader publics that extend about beyond their peer group. Fan subbers will almost always state that they see their peers as other subbers and not generic fans and consumers who they call leechers. They still do care about their leechers, though. They're motivated to produce good work, not only to meet the standards set by their peers, but to uh, appeal to downloads and get high download numbers. It doesn't matter to them. The ability to gain recognition and publicity for the work that they do is one of the affordances of network publics that make it so radically different from the kinds of publics that youth have historically had access to. Fan subbers are competing with commercial media localization industries to get their work out and viewed by fans, and they generally succeed in getting broader audiences than what most companies see with their DVD releases. Although fan subbers get no monetary rewards for the work they do, the reputation and visibility they get from their work is tremendously validating. <clears throat> Another form of fan amateur production that I wanted to talk about are remix videos, or AMVs, anime music videos. AMVs involve taking commercial anime footage the editors strip out the soundtrack and then they re-edit it to conform to a song or another soundtrack of their choosing. So I think it's about time for an interlude, and I wanted to show you a couple AMVs. Um, just out of curiosity, who's seen an AMV? So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of what this work is like. Um, I want to describe a little bit of the practice now. 
So, like in the case of band subs, A and B makers, they start off as on event cons consumers and then they start moving into an identity of a media creator through their engagement with the online communities. This is an interview from an 18-year-old Brazilian A and B creator who goes by Geppetto. He describes his trajectory beginning with the first time he ever saw an AMV. His friend had given him a CD that had a little AMV, uh, it was a CD of anime episodes and it had some AMVs in as a filler. And then he says, I was amazed at the idea that such a pretty little video clip was made by a fan just like me. I was really affected by the video. I put it on a loop and I watched it several times in a row. Then he went on to make his own video after seeing this first AMV. My video took about two and a half hours to make and it turned out extremely horrible, but I loved it. So I asked, it sounds like it was really fresh, exciting to discover, and he says, yes, very exciting. Actually, my heart is racing right now just remembering it. Of course, I'm a weird person, but it's still racing. <laughs> It gives you a sense of some of the passions that these kids are bringing to this. So the story that Geppetto tells of being a fan of the media series and then discovering a fan-produced derivative work is a common narrative in my interviews with fans, especially those involved in creative production. They describe this moment of revelation, of discovery, which is also, and this is really important, it's a moment of identity that this was something created by a fan like me. It's not by an unattainable professional. At that moment, many fans are inspired to take on creation on their own. It's very unlike their exposure to professional media work, where they have this much more distant relationship as an audience. In the case of fan-based production, they will often identify not only as an audience, but as a potential peer and co-creator. And this is really what it means to be part of a networked public and not a traditional media public. Geppetto made his first AMVs on his own by looking at manuals and using the editing software that shipped with his PC. Just like with fan subs, though, being a participant in the community requires commitment and the acquisition of specialized knowledge. A few years later, Geppetto is now an active member of the AMV community online, and he looks to the online community for ongoing feedback and help. And he's become an expert himself. He says, I love the forums, I love the chats, I love answering questions and having mine answered in turn. So again, this, these conditions of reciprocity. I could spend 24 hours straight discovering AMVs without so much as a coffee break. So, he did manage to interest a few of his local school friends in a and making, but none of them took, it to, took to it to the extent that he did. He relies heavily on the online network community of editors as sources of knowledge and expertise and for models to aspire to. In fact, in his local community now, he is known as a video expert by both his peers and adults. After seeing his a &B work, one of his high school teachers asked him to teach a video workshop to younger students. So he jokes, even though I know nothing by the standards of the online group, in his local community, I am the greater god of video editing. In other words, the development of his identity and competence as a video editor it never would have been supported purely within his local community. That expertise doesn't exist there. It was the network relations mediated by the internet that led to this ongoing peer-based learning and specialization. The main site that Geppetto accesses to connect with the AMV community is animemusicvideos.org. It's a discussion and a video distribution site that was handcrafted by AMV creators to meet their specialized needs. The AMV community doesn't like general purpose video aggregator sites. In fact, if you type YouTube in their discussion forums, it's automatically censored. Uh, they, spend, they place a high value on specialized knowledge and expertise and informed critique, general purpose rating schemes, casual audiences are not of interest to this community, so they have their own custom sort of ranking and evaluation schemes on the site, including things like top-rated videos, um, and also much more involved sort of reviews, what they call opinion information that creators share among one another. Uh, so they will talk about feedback from even very small numbers as validating. The point is really the personal connection with peers who are appreciative and knowledgeable in these deep, niche forms of uh, culture. And at the core, this is an orientation that sees media creation remix as a process of communication with a specialized community of practice. This is the hallmark of interest-driven genres of participation. Absolute Destiny, another AMV creator, describes the steps that it took him to become uh, one of the most recognized names in the AMV world today. 
he describes how he started by dabbling in video creation. He, you know, engaged with the text as a viewer, and then he started slowly engaging with the broader social ecology around AMVs. So he says, you know, first you try to make something, you show it to a few friends, maybe you'll take the leap to getting to know some people online and uploading it to the org, adding a music videos.org. You might enter a competition. And then he says, when you decide to go to a big convention and meet other AMV creators, that's another level again. At these conventions, when we get together and we talk about each other's videos, and you start to understand that the videos are actually conversations among A and B creators. You wouldn't necessarily know that from just watching the videos. In a lot of ways, this description reminded me of my own induction into the esoteric and niche knowledge communities of academia, where one traces a path from engagement with text as a reader to becoming an apprentice as a graduate student and a writer, and finally to engagement with the richer social ecology around knowledge and sharing once you become an actual peer within the community. What's different here, though, is that these practices of socialization, deep knowledge sharing,